Mexico City was once known as the most polluted city in the world. The air quality here is still bad. Today, the AQI reached 123, which is unhealthy for people with respiratory problems. And you feel it. Your eyes get watery, your throat scratchy, and the sky looks hazy. But in the 90s and early 2000s, air quality would routinely hit extremely bad levels with AQI in the 200s. So how did it get better? Essentially, the government got tough on pollution with a complex system of countermeasures. Less efficient cars are allowed limited time on the road. And as soon as the air quality gets bad, either too high a concentration of ozone or particulate matter, the government orders even newer, more efficient cars off the streets. They order factories to reduce their output. Food vendors are prohibited from using charcoal. And road work stops. If the air quality doesn't improve, the countermeasures get tougher. It can mean residents can't drive to work or school, for example, so they have to walk, bike, or take public transportation. If it gets bad enough, government offices are shut down. And this program has made a huge difference. In the 90s, Mexico City faced terrible air every month. Mexicans used to joke the air was so bad so often that birds would die mid-flight. Currently, really bad days are rare. We only have a handful of environmental contingencies each year. I'm Anthony in Seoul, where my air quality app is telling me the air quality right now is 70, which is moderate, not terrible. I used to report from Beijing, where until recent years, air pollution was off and off the charts. I used to live in an old neighborhood and burn coal in stoves to heat my home. That was before we had apps and air quality monitors, and many people around me had difficulty telling the difference between weather and pollution, fog and smog. Sure, it was unhealthy, but I saw it as part of the story I was covering and living. In recent years, Beijing's air has improved as the government has moved factories out of the city center and phased out coal stoves. When I moved to Seoul four and a half years ago, I thought I was leaving the smog behind, but I was wrong. It followed me. Some of South Korea's air pollution blows over from China. A lot of it is homemade. Yoon song yeol who took over as South Korea's president last year, has said that by the end of his five-year term, he'll get air quality up to the level of London or Paris. So far this year, though, we've had plenty of bad air days of air quality of 100 or worse. Not much I can do on those except stay indoors, crank up the air purifiers, and wait for a stiff northwest wind to blow the smog away. This is Shalu in New Delhi, opening my curtains to see what it looks like outside. The sun is out, the sky is looking blue, but there's also a fair bit of dust flying around as morning traffic builds up here. The AQI app on my phone tells me that the air outside today is unhealthy for sensitive groups. The AQI level is 117, which is frankly not alarming enough for Delhiites to be worried. And that's because we have it so much worse in winters when the AQI level sometimes goes beyond 700. When it's that time of the year, I often don't need the app to tell me how grim it is outside. It's so bad that my eyes burn as soon as I wake up. I can taste the pollutants in my mouth and the lungs feel like an overworked machine that needs a break. In fact, some studies suggest that breathing in the Delhi air is as dangerous as smoking about two dozen cigarettes a day. Emissions from factories, vehicles, and burning of stubble by farmers, all these factors come together to make Delhi's air toxic. And the government's efforts to relieve the problem, restricting building construction and traffic to try and mitigate the pollution isn't really enough. That was Ada Peralta in Mexico City, Anthony Kuhn in Seoul, Shalu Yadav in New Delhi.